Welcome to our small lecture series on control systems using Python. And in the part one of the lecture, we are going to discuss how we can define transfer function models and how we can simulate their transient responses. We are going to see how we can define a transfer function model, uh, transfer function model, and calculate their step response, impulse response, and response to any arbitrary input. All right. So again, here is the agenda for today's discussion. And let's proceed with this. So first of all, you have to have some sort of Python distribution installed in your computer. And I would strongly recommend that you have, if you don't have anything installed already, I would strongly recommend that you install Anaconda Python distribution in your computer. Okay, just visit anaconda.com. So Python is a, uh, is a free and open source software. You can just download and install it. So install this, or if you don't have a good enough computer, then uh, I would strongly recommend that you go to Google Colab uh, at colab.research.google.com. And from there, you can just use uh, Jupyter Notebooks online. All right, so you, and you can follow whatever we are doing today. All right, so first of all, you have to install the control system package. By default, control system package won't be installed in your computer. And from a Jupyter Notebook console, you can actually um, do pip install control. Of course, from here, we have to put an exclamation sign because we are calling it from inside Jupyter Notebook here, all right? So you have to install the control system package. And of course, as you can see, I already have the control system package installed. The version of the control system package that I am using here is version 0.8.4. I'm mentioning this because the APIs might change in the future. All right. <clears throat> so let's start. And before we begin, we have to import the control system library. So we are importing the control system library and then we have to also import NumPy and matplotlib. And let's define a transfer function now. All right. So here is the transfer function with a denominator polynomial and a numerator polynomial. And you know already if you are already familiar with uh, familiar with uh, tools like matlab and scilab you might find this syntax pretty similar what we are doing from inside the control system library we are importing we are actually calling the transfer function function and passing in two lists these lists are containing the numerators coefficients and the denominators coefficients so the numerators coefficient is essentially three and the denominators coefficient are one two and three we're just passing those in and we are getting the transfer function back Right, so G1 is the transfer function object here. Now, if you have a slightly more complicated transfer function, the recommended way is to actually define a transfer function variable here. So S is a transfer function variable, which is defined this way. And then with that transfer function variable, you can define any transfer function object. So you don't have to expand this product and create a, a polynomial and then write down the transfer function. You don't have to do, do that. Once you define a transfer function variable, you can proceed and write down any transfer function you want. Right. So here is an exercise problem for you. Uh, you have to define this transfer function as an exercise. Of course, you can expand the numerator and write down the coefficients and define the transfer function that way. But the recommended way in this one is also to create the transfer function variable here s and then define the transfer function. So uh, give it a try. So now using the standard operators in Python, you can do transfer function algebra pretty easily, pretty effortlessly here. So let's define two transfer functions gs and hs. So again, you already know how to define those transfer functions. And then we can apply, we can do multiply two transfer functions, we can add two transfer functions, we can subtract two transfer functions, we can do any sort of algebraic manipulation, we can multiply a transfer function with a scalar, okay, and we can divide transfer functions, we can multiply individual transfer functions with scalars and add them, subtract them, multiply them, divide them, right. So any valid algebraic operation would be fine with them, right. Similarly, if you want to create a feedback loop, out of g and h so g is the power path transfer function h is the feedback transfer function and if you want to create a negative feedback loop you can just call the feedback uh, function from inside the control library and uh, pass in the g and h you get the feedback transfer function if you want to create a positive feedback for some reason you have to define you have to say a sign equal to one or you can achieve any of these using the uh, transfer function algebra simply right so if you want to define the negative feedback transfer function you can always write it as g divided by one plus g times h Okay, that would yield the same result here. All right. 
Now, if you have a transfer function object, then you can call the pole method and the zero method on, on the transfer function object to calculate the poles and the zeros, locations of the poles and the locations of the zeros. So here G is the transfer function object and we already defined it earlier. And if I call the pole method on, on that, we get the poles. And if I call the zero method on that, we get the locations of the zeros, right? And now here's an exercise for you. I have given you a transfer function G and a transfer function H and you have to calculate the closed loop pole locations and the closed loop loca locations of the closed loop zeros, right? So you have to first define the closed loop transfer function and then calculate the closed loop poles and zeros. Give it a try. All right. So now let's start with the impulse response of a system. So let's define, so we have already defined a system G1 earlier, right? And in order to calculate the impulse response of that system, it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so all you have to do, you have to define the time span first. So the time span is defined using any NumPy array here. So we are using take, we are taking uh, linear space from uh, NumPy, and using linear space, we are creating an array that starts at zero and ends at ten, and we are taking a thousand points there. And then you have to call this. Okay, you have to call the impulse response function, pass in the transfer function and pass in the time array to calculate the impulse response. And if you plot this, this is the result. But the thing is you don't have to define the time array by default. Okay, so if you don't want to define, define the time array by default, let's just comment this out. Okay, so I am not defining the time array anymore. In that case, I cannot pass the time array here, but the result here will generate a time array for me. See? So that's also a way in which you can actually uh, do the impulse response here. Of course, the underscore was essentially a discarded variable. Underscore is used for discarded variables in Python, right? So you can just call the impulse response function. Similarly, step you can also call the step response function without any explicit time declaration. Okay, you can just pass in the transfer function or a state space object for that matter, and um, you would get the response here, impulse response, and the time array back. And you can use those to plot it. So again, just uh, keep in mind that if you do that, uh, Python would, uh, the program control system package would actually figure out how long you want to see the impulse response, okay? So probably you maybe you don't want, no, you probably, you wouldn't want to see the impulse response up to 10 seconds, right? Because we initially defined it, the impulse response up to 10 seconds. That is why it gave me the impulse response up to 10 seconds, right? Now it will, it will judicially figure out how much, how long it is going to show you the impulse response, right? So you can do this as well. So here you can see, it only is showing me the impulse response up to like, uh, something like uh, five seconds maybe, okay? All right, but again, I would strongly recommend that you don't do this. Instead, you define the time and then calculate the impulse response. That gives you complete control over how long the impulse response or the transient response in general is plotted for you. All right, let's proceed uh, with the next example. Okay, so here an exercise again, once again for you. So I have given you a system, a very simple one, and you have to calculate the impulse response of this system, right? It will be pretty easy if you understood the previous example. All right, so let's see the next one. So here I, I'm doing a step, I'm calculating the step response of that same system. It's pretty easy. And if you just, if you go through the previous code, okay, the only thing that I have changed here is that I have changed the impulse response function to a step response function. Everything else has been kept the same. Everything else has been kept the same, all right? And as such, we have the step response up to 10 seconds. And as before, I can always not take the time array initially and I can make the function return the time array for me. And here, just like before, it will figure out how long I might want to see the transient response. Essentially, pretty much shortly after the response settles down actually, right? And it will now, instead of calculating the response for 10 seconds, it will calculate the response for a slightly less amount of time and plot it, okay? And I can see the transient response as such, all right? So that's pretty fine, I guess. But again, uh, my recommendation is that you explicitly define the time array and generate the response as such. All right, so here is another exercise for you. I have given you a transfer function. Try defining the transfer function and then calculate the step response. All right, so here is a neat example. 
okay yeah those who are studying control systems you might have seen this in your books okay your teachers might have already uh, shown you this kind of a plot so here this is a generalized second order system without any uh, zero without any finite zero okay and for this example we are considering the untamped natural frequency to be equal to one and what we are doing we are essentially calculating the step response for different values of uh, zeta damping ratio all right and here is the plot see and we are actually plotting them in the same plot so here is the code it's a very simple code it's a uh, basic python for loop and what we are doing we are checking the step response under different damping issues as you can see as the damping ratio increases the step response uh, essentially uh, when the damping ratio was zero it was essentially an undamped system and when the, as the step response increased the damping increased and the overshoots decreased and as such the response became damped and damped okay so this is called a neat example you might have seen this any in any control systems engineering book actually all right so let's proceed with this and let's now see how we can actually calculate the response of a system under any arbitrary input under any arbitrary input okay so let's now consider we have a system let's now consider a system uh, g and this system it's a very simple one okay so it's a first order system and this is pretty similar to a series rc circuit okay and let's see let's create a pulse here this is the we are using this uh, part of the functions to create a pulse all right and here in this one what we are doing we are creating a pulse and then feeding that as the input to the system okay so we are creating a pulse and feeding that as the input to the system so what you can see that once we do that Okay, we can pretty much do that using this forced response function here from the control system library. So for this one, it is mandatory that you put the time function. Okay, not mandatory really, but you should. Otherwise, the arrays might. Um, so otherwise, the time would be implied from the input array actually. All right. But the thing is, you should put the time array here and you should put the input array here. So input is this pulse here. Okay. And once you do that, you can see that we have generated the step response pretty easily, right? And here is an exercise for you, okay? So I've given you another system and here is the uh, input for you. The input is a sine wave, okay? Pure sine wave, all right? And you are supposed to, you are uh, gonna try to calculate the response of the system under this input. Thank you very much. I'm going to see you in the next one.